Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Boddy. I'm the membership and events manager at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for being here today, our members for joining us for our third virtual member program. And I also want to give a special welcome to some of James Good's family and close friends who are also joining us today. So curatorial fellow Sarah Kelly will be leading today's program, but before I welcome her, I just want to go over some housekeeping. So first, your microphones are muted and your video is turned off by default. Please note that we're recording today's program, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure your audio and video remain off. And the microphone and camera symbols will have some red lines right through them that indicate that they're off. Uh, the recording will be shared in tomorrow's museum e-blast. The next thing I wanted to tell you is if you have um, any questions or comments you wanna make during today's program, you are more than welcome to. Uh, there are two options for doing this. The first is to type your question or comment into the chat box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. Sarah will read these questions um, when she gets to a good stopping point, and I encourage you to enter your questions or comments as we go. That will really prevent any dead air as we wait for folks to type them up. Um, and the second option is to raise your hand by using the raise hand button, um, which you'll find by clicking the participants button at the bottom of your screen. And when there's time, I will call on anyone with a raised hand and unmute, unmute your audio so you can speak directly to Sarah. And finally, if there's anything we can do to improve this format within Zoom, please let us know. Um, I'll send out a program evaluation after this program concludes so you can share your feedback that way or you can feel free to email me directly. So welcome again, thank you for being here and now I will turn this over to Sarah. Hi everyone, can you hear me? So I'm going to turn my video back off and let you look at a nice picture of me that was taken about a year ago, but I just wanted to let you know that I am here and I'm a real person. Um, so let's get started. I'm so glad you all could join us today. Um, let's see, there we go. I hope everyone's staying healthy and finding some nice positive ways to keep entertained and busy um, in this crazy time. So my name is Sarah Kelly um, and I'm the curatorial fellow here at the museum right now. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about a really incredible collection of ceramics that was donated to the museum um, over a period of several years, uh, starting in the early 2000s by James Goode. This entire collection is over 300 ceramic pictures. Um, and a few tumblers and cups and things like that, um, but primarily um, over 250 of the pieces are just pictures. Um, before we get into a lot of detail, I thought I would take just a moment to introduce myself. Um, some of you might be wondering, uh, what is a curatorial fellow? Um, what, do you, what am I doing? Um, I know I saw a few familiar faces on the RSVP list. Um, to those of you I've met, hi. I'm glad to, glad to see you here. Um, some of you might know that I started uh, last fall as a Wingate Museum intern, um, which is awarded through the Center for Craft here in Asheville. Um, and as an intern, in addition to creating an exhibition of ceramics um, in the McClinton Gallery, which you will be able to see as soon as we reopen, um, one of the projects I was assigned was working with the Goud Collection. Um, and a lot of the really in-depth research and things on this collection um, were um, a little bit interrupted by our reopening event. So um, being a curatorial fellow coming back for another term um, was a way for me to have an opportunity to really dive into this collection, uh, which I was just thrilled about. Um, so uh, you might wonder too, why me? Um, I started looking through the pictures last fall um, and the curatorial team realized that I knew a little bit about ceramics. Um, I will admit I'm certainly no expert, um, and I don't come from an art history background like a lot of curators do. Um, I'm currently finishing my last semester of a master's degree at Warren Wilson College. It's a new program there in critical craft studies. Um, my, my specialty academically is actually thinking through ways to theorize, um, utilize, and teach craft in dynamic ways that sort of offer criticality. Um, 
rather than any kind of linear or singular history. So basically I specialize in asking a lot of unanswerable questions, um, which is really a lot of fun, um, though at times confusing even to me. Um, so much of what I'm sharing with you today comes from material knowledge um, and experiential knowledge that I've learned over the years uh, working uh, as a potter. Um, I have been an artist uh, for over a decade. That's what I went to undergraduate for is uh, painting and pottery. Um, and I've also run craft fairs and worked in many galleries over the years. Um, and a lot of times my knowledge is coming from my own network of colleagues and friends who work in the field, um, as well as research that I've been working on through my graduate degree. So I am still researching the items that you were going to be seeing today. And I realized that many of you have a lot of knowledge that you might be able to actually share about these pieces. So again, I will encourage you, um, if you have questions, if you have any insights, um, please feel free to type in your comments into the chat box. I would love to hear from you as much as you feel comfortable uh, sharing with us. Um, and please note too, um, I do realize that the photo quality in some of these slides is not ideal. Um, as you know, we're working from home right now, um, and I don't have direct access to the pictures in the collection since I'm not on site. Um, so about half the pieces we'll look at today are actually photos that I took on my phone of photos in paper files. Um, so bear with me as we look through those. Um, but I think that it sort of goes to show um, some of the things that we're working on from home right now and how we're how we're working from home, which I actually think is, um, is kind of fun for you to see. Um, so before we dive in, um, Kristen, I'm going to turn it back over to you for just a second if you want to do just a little bit of housekeeping for anybody who maybe has joined later. Sure. So for those of you who only just joined, I just want to remind you all that we are recording today's program. So please make sure your video and microphone remain off if you don't want to be part of the recording. And second, if you do have any questions, you can do as Sarah recommended, which is type your questions or comments into the chat box. The other option is to raise your hand, which you can find under the participants button at the bottom of your screen. And when there's a good moment, I will call on you, unmute you and you can speak directly to Sarah. So that's about it. If you have any questions during this, feel free to send a direct message to me or Sarah during this message or during this program and uh, we can try and help you through anything that you have going on technologically. All right, back to you, Sarah. So who is James Goode? Uh, Goode was born in Statesville, North Carolina, which is just over an hour east of Asheville. You head straight down I-40 um, and spent much of his adult life uh, in the Washington DC area. Um, I'd like to actually read a little excerpt from the Washington Post to you um, that I think describes a lot of things. Dr. Goode came to Washington area in 1966 as a teacher of American history at George Mason University. Then from 1968 to 1970, was a reference librarian at the Library of Congress. From 1970 to 1987, he was a Smithsonian Institution staffer who organized exhibits and lectures, gave walking tours, and wrote books. He resigned in 1988 to work on a doctoral degree in American Studies, which he received from George Washington University in 1995. In 2015, he received the second annual Visionary Historian Award from the Histo Historical Society of Washington, DC, and for a lifetime body of work, which represents the highest achievement in the study of Washington, DC. I just thought that was so lovely and really shows you um, such a variety of work that uh, Gu did um, and what a, what a wonderful um, contribution to the Washington, DC area. Um, in addition to his multiple degrees, Goode learned from the walking tours he led around DC um, and about public sculpture and architecture in the area, um, and from working with regional collectors as well, um, learning about works in their collections, and then going on to share some of the information that he learned from these collectors um, and his books and other, and other work that he did. Um, I will share with you a little bit about um, his his writing. Um, and you're seeing just a couple of the covers of books that he has published. Um, this is not an uh, all inclusive list. There are more that, um, that you're not seeing here. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, so a lot of a lot of this information is shared, and I just love so much. Um, I have to admit to you, I have not read these, but after doing a little bit more research, I can't wait to. I'm really excited about them, um, and I'm thinking too of our assistant curator Whitney Richardson, who I know is probably here, and I bet that she would love these as well. Um, they're mostly about outdoor sculpture and architecture in the Washington DC area. Um, the one that you're seeing on the left is called The Outdoor Sculpture of Washington DC, a Comprehensive Historical Guide, um, published by the Smithsonian in 1974. Um, and it, this was kind of developed out of the walking tours that he was giving um, around this time as he was walking around and seeing all these works of art. Um, and some that are maybe understated or maybe that you know, people that you haven't heard of and that kind of things, public monuments. Um, and I just, I think that's really wonderful. Um, the middle one is called Capital Losses, A Cultural History of Washington's Destroyed Buildings, which I just find fascinating. Um, this is also published by the Smithsonian. Um, this is the second edition cover uh, published in 2003, um, a little bit more recent. Um, which is about buildings that were being torn down, um, many of which were taken down in his time in Washington um, and replaced with something new. And sort of, I was reading about this and I was actually thinking of, of Asheville as well. I know any of you who live in the area, we're constantly seeing change. We're seeing, you know, old, beautiful brick apartment buildings and things like that being torn down and new ones put up in place. And so this is kind of talking about um, that a little bit um, and gets into a little bit of. Um, uh, yeah, so some beautiful um, old buildings that are, are now missing and, and was kind of proud about that. Um, the other one is called Best Addresses. Um, this is also from 2003, um, which is about apartment buildings in the DC area. And it touches a little bit more on urban planning. Um, and I think of to like multi-use spaces and that kind of thing. Um, so I found that really fascinating as well. Um, just out of curiosity, has anyone else in the, in the meeting read any of these books? Um, I would love to hear about them if so. Um, and I know I, I knew that he was a writer and was interested in, in these subjects. Um, however, um, I really I hope to get to read some of these in the future. Um, the impression that I got when I was looking up these books is just that um, Good was just a wonderful storyteller. Um, and I, and I that makes me want to read these even more as I can almost just, there's a tone almost in everything that I read that just sounded like they would just be wonderful reads. So hopefully that's in my near future. So again, sorry for the photo quality here. Um, these, are, these are pictures of pictures of pictures. Um, talk about a tongue twister today. I thought about that some as I was, I was rehearsing. Um, I just love these images. So these are actually the shelves um, that Good kept. Um, and <laughs> I just think it starts to show you an idea of the monumentality of this collection. Um, what you're seeing here is only about, I tried to count, I didn't get an exact count, but maybe 80 pictures or so. Um, and remember the collection is over 300. So this is really hardly doing it justice, um, but just gives you a little bit of an idea of, of, of what we now have in the collection. So what is the collection of pictures? So they're all contemporary works um, made uh, from a range of about 20 to 25 past years. Um, most of them were made sometime between the late 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s. Um, and what I love about this collection is many of these artists are, are still working today. Um, and I think that just makes for really great um, stories to tell. Um, these are all functional pieces um, and they're made to be used. Um, and it's an American collection, so the pictures are all from artists residing in the United States, um, and many geographies across the United States are represented. And I, I'm just looking at the comments here. James's books are really textbooks for historians and students of architectural history. Great, thank you for that. So you all might be wondering why Gu decided if he spent most of his life in the Washington DC area, why the Asheville Art Museum for this collection? Um, and I was so delighted to hear that some of his friends, family, and colleagues would be joining our call today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it's wonderful to have you all. 
Um, something that I read and, and I don't know much about is that he did live in Asheville um, for at least part of his life uh, growing up. Uh, if anyone has anything to share about that, I would love to know that as well. Um, what I do know for sure is that um, Good uh, frequently made trips to the Asheville area to visit, and that was a big part of his collecting. He liked to visit potters in their studios to meet them personally, get to know them, um, and really saw Western North Carolina as one of the major pottery producing areas in the United States, um, and felt really the, the pieces most suited for display and preservation in the Asheville area, um, especially since so many of the makers in his collection worked in the North Carolina area, especially in Western North Carolina. Um, though again, of course, this is a national collection, so not exclusively from North Carolina. And as far as pictures go, um, it's my understanding that he began collecting pictures around the mid 90s. Um, and uh, this is a time when really teapots were kind of a fad. Um, a lot of people were connect, uh, collecting teapots, making teapots, um, really kind of funky, wacky things. Um, and uh, he was really attracted to the versatility and the functionality of the picture, um, that it was sort of a timeless and endlessly useful form. Um, and I really, I really appreciate that. So the Asheville Art Museum, our, our vision is to transform lives through art. Our mission is to engage, enlighten, and inspire individuals and enrich community through dynamic experiences in American art of the 20th and 21st centuries. So if you think about what I just told you about Good's collection, it fits this perfectly. Um, so when considering any new um, acquisitions to our collections, it's central for curatorial and leadership teams at the museum to ensure the incoming works sort of speak to this mission um, and allow us to sort of tell stories within this mission and this narrative. Um, and this collection really provides museum with some amazing opportunities to tell regional and national narratives um, and to highlight some of the relationships um, and enhance narratives we can tell um, with these relationships. Um, and in, in craft, um, of course, um, and contemporary design as well, but we can tell stories of process, of technique through some of the pieces in here. Um, and there are also just some really fascinating relationships with some of the pieces in this collection to things that are already in our collection. Um, and so I want to get to some examples and let you see some nice pictures. Um, I thought I would just throw out a couple of terms that you might see up on the screen or hear throughout this, and I'm not going to bore you with defining them all, um, but I thought I would just give you a little bit of warning that some of these things will come up and um, I will try my best to explain them when we see them in the works. Um, and again, please feel free if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. I'll be happy to answer them as we go. Um, and out of curiosity, do we have any potters here today or anyone who has maybe tried pottery once or twice in a class at some point, anything like that? So let's look at some work. All right, a beginner, great. <laughs> So our first examples, we're going to look at Michael Klein, Sam Taylor, and Mark Shapiro. These first examples are three artists that are currently active in the national ceramic sphere and are quite well known within contemporary functional clay communities in the United States. Um, they all began firing and making together in Massachusetts uh, in the late 1980s. Um, and though they were coming from a variety of different backgrounds, they were kind of helping each other learn um, and I just, I love the thought of them uh, sharing this studio. Um, all had a hand in bringing uh, stone pool pottery to life. Um, and that's a studio where uh, Mark Shapiro is still active today. Um, the three took a uh, Michael Simon, uh, who's another potter. Uh, they took a class together at Penland in 1989. Um, and all cite this experience as hugely impactful in their careers. Um, and then they all, so they took this class together, you know, spent a couple of weeks at Penland here in Western North Carolina, and then went back to Massachusetts and set up their studio together. Um, and they continued together in this way for about a decade um, before Taylor set up his own studio, which is called Dog Bar. Um, and Michael Klein moved back to the Penland area where he's working today. 
Um, though I was familiar with the work of all of these artists um, prior to researching this collection, um, I didn't know that they all worked together in this capacity, and I didn't know that they um, all had this workshop together, which I thought was, was really nice. Um, does everyone know what Penland is? Um, Penland School of Crafts is about an hour northeast of Asheville. Um, it's a non-credit craft school. So it's not an academic institution. You don't have to apply. Um, anyone can pay and take classes there. Um, it was founded in 1929 by Lucy Morgan. Yeah, I love Finland, it's great. Um, and really began with a heavy base in teaching weaving as an economic supplement to locals in the area um, who, wanted, who wanted to learn and um, who were looking for an economic um, supplement. Um, it's typically residential when you take a class there. Um, you go and live on campus um, and have access to the studios day and night. Um, people come from all over the world, uh, both to take classes and to teach there. Um, and there's also a three-year resident artist program. There's a core fellowship program, which is for artists who are a little bit earlier in their careers and want a really intensive, I think it's, I think it's a two-year program, maybe one year, I think two though. Um, and it's, it's just a great way for them to take a wide variety of different classes and sort of uh, really develop their skills. Um, so Penland offers classes in all kinds of uh, subject matter and media, um, from painting to weaving, um, ceramics, of course, glass, um, metals. They have a huge iron studio, but they also do small metals like jewelry and that kind of thing. And I'm sure there's plenty more. So back to Michael Klein. Um, he was actually the only only one of these three who had an art degree before he started making ceramics. Um, he's a he's now living in Bakersville, North Carolina, and uh, participates in a lot of regional fairs and markets. Uh, for example, the Spruce Pine Potters Market. I know he's he's there a lot of years. Um, he participates in the Potters Market Invitational at the Mint Museum, um, and he does a lot of teaching uh, in the area as well. Um, and host apprentices, I believe, as well at his studio. So he began working with Clay in college, and while he initially pursued actually civil engineering, um, he graduated with a, a BFA in ceramics in the mid 80s. Um, then he took this workshop, of course, with uh, Shapiro and Taylor, and they developed their studio. Um, he was also, uh, after about a decade up in Massachusetts, he returned to the Penland area uh, as a resident artist where he was for three years. Um, and then he set up his own studio and has been in the area ever since. Um, I will have you notice on a lot of these slides, um, I'm putting the name where the, where the artist is currently making, if they're currently making. And I also have a lot of their Instagram handles. Um, and I've done this, uh, this is not, you know, of course, something that you would normally put on a museum label or anything like that. But I thought, you know, we're all at home right now. Uh, we, we have a lot to think about. And I thought it might be fun to kind of give you all a way to engage with some of these artists if you find that you, you might like to do that at some point. So just notice it's not there for everyone, um, but it is for a lot of folks who, who are active uh, on social media. So oh, this piece here, um, he's, Michael Klein has worked in a range of styles and processes over the years. Um, and this was made in 2001, um, which would be about the time he was finishing his uh, residency at Penland. So it could have been made when he was there or shortly after. Um, again, he'd only been back in North Carolina for a couple of years, but he was really inspired by some of the work that he'd seen by the Catawba Valley Potters. And that's an area um, about an hour, just over an hour from Asheville, headed towards uh, the central part of the state. Um, Kathy, I see you. Yes, um, I can. I would be happy to send that afterwards. Um, Kristen can give, uh, we can find a way to get in touch with a list of, of folks in attendance and I can, I'm more than happy to send out a list of handles. Great. Um, so yes, he was inspired by the Catawba Valley Potters. Um, and I haven't actually seen uh, this piece in person. Um, however, at this point, I think he was primarily still wood firing as he had been doing in Massachusetts. Um, and I thought I would share also um, a piece of his contemporary work. And I actually just, uh, I took this from his web shop. Um, so this is, you know, made very recently. 
Um, but you can see some sort of similarity in the patterning. Um, however, the one on the right hand side, I know that uh, right now he's also doing some gas firing, which is a different type of firing process. Um, but he was inspired uh, to do some of the this contemporary work after he visited the Freer Sackler wing at the Smithsonian um, and saw some 15th century Korean techniques um, and started applying some of these ideas to his own work. Um, so I thought I would just let you see as well what he's up to right now. Um, and I just love how you can see, you know, these are over 10 years apart, almost 20 years apart uh, in their making, but you can see a really similar um, sort of coloration um, and a little bit of that patterning technique that's coming in there. So Mark Shapiro was working uh, in New York as a sculptor. He was supporting himself actually through carpentry before he decided to move to rural Massachusetts and learn pottery. Uh, Stone Pool Studio, again, is his studio where the three artists were working together. Um, they host apprentices there. Um, so he is teaching another generation uh, ceramics as well. Um, this piece was definitely wood fired. Um, it's stoneware, which basically means it's just a high fired um, type of clay. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think what's been what's happened here is there's a flashing slip which has been applied um, to the outside of the pot. Um, you can see some kind of speckling on the surface here. Um, probably coming through from iron in the clay. Um, and I wish I could zoom in so you could see that a little bit more. Um, but you can also see these sort of rings and ridges in the pot, which is how we can see that it was thrown also on the ceramics wheel. And finally, for this section, Sam Taylor. Um, his studio currently is Dog Bar Pottery, and he is still in Massachusetts. Um, this is, uh, again, another example of some slip work. The last one we called a flashing slip. Um, this is uh, made from a tile six kind of clay. So a slip is, uh, it's similar to a glaze. However, it's primarily made up of um, just clay and you mix it basically with water and apply it to the surface of the pot to just add some color or some contrast. So Taylor actually studied art history as an undergraduate. He's mostly self-taught um, with the help from some workshops and creative companionship with Klein and Shapiro. Um, I love thinking about all of these pieces together um, and these artists together. We don't have a definite date for Shapiro's piece, um, but the other two were made around 2001, so about the same time. And after Klein had come back to North Carolina, um, so they all weren't, weren't all sharing a studio space anymore. Um, but the pieces illustrate the beauty of the sort of collaborative learning and really show that people can learn in a similar environment and place, but with really stylistic outcomes different um, if they so choose. I do love how these potters show the regional impact of Western North Carolina and how this impact shapes um, not just our area um, and the artists living here now, but the experiences those far beyond the borders of this region as well. So coming here, taking this class at Penland, and then going back to Massachusetts or wherever and taking sort of this experience in this place with them. Next up is Sequoia Miller, um, who I just find really fascinating. Um, I have to tell you all, I actually spent a lot of time last week in a wonderful video of Sequoia Miller um, giving a walking tour of an exhibition that he curated at the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, I believe while he was working on his doctoral dissertation there. Um, the link is at the bottom of the screen. Um, that's another thing that I'm happy to share later on if anyone is interested. Um, and what I love about this exhibition, it's called The Ceramic Presence in Modern Art. Um, and I have to say, the video is incredibly calming and informative. It's really beautifully done. Um, but what I love is that you can actually see several of the artists he talks about. Um, they're paired together right now in our permanent collection. So as soon as we reopen, um, you can, if you are interested in this video and you see it, you can actually come back um, and, and see some of these things in our collection as well. 
Um, Miller has a, a bachelor's degree in Russian and art history, um, a master's degree in decorative art, design history, and material culture, um, and just completed a PhD uh, in the history of art from Yale. Um, he has just actually uh, been named the chief curator at the Gardner Museum in Toronto. Um, and Miller also actually um, began his ceramics career with a workshop at Penland. Um, and I just thought that was such a wonderful, again, tie into our region um, and, and seeing how uh, things that people learn here um, can go all over the country. This is uh, Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin. This is not a piece from the Good Collection, um, but Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin um, taught the class that was uh, Miller's first introduction to clay here at Penland School. And I just thought I would share that with you. Um, this piece will be out uh, as soon as we reopen in a, uh, an exhibition of ceramics on our second floor core gallery. These are examples of Miller's work. Um, these were both made in around 2005. Um, so after uh, undergrad and before returning to graduate school, Miller had a solid decade as a studio potter um, and exhibited his work quite, quite widely um, before going back to graduate school. Um, I have to admit, I don't know a ton about his process, um, but this looks to me like uh, glazed stoneware. Um, I would guess he's probably using some kind of uh, resist technique in the piece on the left. So what this means, what he would uh, glaze the piece with one color and then take something like a wax resist or a latex resist and you can kind of paint it on, which I would think would be where you're seeing stripes. And then you can coat it with a second glaze on top. Um, and then where that resist was, uh, you'll actually, once the piece is fired, it will kind of bead away and you'll see the uh, the glaze that was underneath. What I love so much about these pieces of being in the collection is the way that they provide the opportunity that, to tell a, a great story of how any potter, or any artist, you know, does not necessarily have any kind of linear career. Um, so he went from studying Russian and art history to over a decade as a, as a potter and a maker um, and exhibiting his work and doing all these great shows um, and then went back to school and is now a chief curator at the Gardner. And I just think that's a fabulous story. Does anybody have any questions? I see, please review the meaning of tile six. So again, tile six is um, similar. So you can glaze a piece or you can it's basically something that you can use as a surface decoration. So tile six is actually just a type of clay. Um, and as a slip, if you make a slip with tile six, um, basically you're gonna water it down and, and add it to the surface of the, of the pot um, and use it like a glaze. Yeah, Miller shapes have interesting hard edges and graphic lines. Yeah, they definitely do. And one really cool thing is actually if you look at the piece on the right, where you can see some highlights from the lighting when the picture was taken, you again, you see these kind of throwing ridges like it was actually thrown on a potter's wheel. And then he was uh, transforming and altering the piece afterwards. So this was probably thrown actually in a sphere on the potter's wheel and then taken off the wheel. And once it dried just a little bit, he probably kind of flattened the piece. And so you're seeing, it actually reminds me of like a geologic formation where you can see layers in the earth and then they rise, you know, as the mountains rise um, and there's uplift. So you can see these ridges, but they're, they're no longer um, sort of concentric and, and flat linear that way. I think that's really fun to see. So women who wood fire. This is kind of a personal passion project for me. I just, I love it. I think that's so great. Um, and some of that's coming from my own personal experience um, is my love of clay grew immensely um, the first time I fired a wood kiln uh, when I was in college. And, you know, wood firing requires a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of physical labor. Um, it's time consuming. There's no set it and forget it on a wood kiln. Um, and, you know, there are wood kilns. You can build a really small wood kiln that can be fired, you know, sometimes in 10 or 12 hours. Um, if you do that intentionally, um, 
but a lot of them take days and days on end to fire and they require really big teams of people. You have to have people up all night stoking the kilns with wood and um, making sure that the temperature is rising at the pace that you want it to and, and all that is absolutely manual. Um, it's all done by hand. There's no uh, machine that can, can get those settings to happen for you. Um, let's see. So these are just a couple of examples. Um, there is actually an Instagram page for women who wood fire, um, and it was started by artist Tara Wilson, who we'll see some work from in just a minute. First is Pam Owens. Pam Owens is currently working at uh, Jugtown Pottery, which is in Seagrove, North Carolina. Um, has anyone been to Seagrove, North Carolina to visit potteries there? Um, it's really close to Asheboro, just south of Greensboro. Um, it's very close to actually the North Carolina Zoo in Asheboro, if anyone's been there. Um, it's about two and a half, three hours from here. Um, and it's currently home to somewhere between 70 and 100 potters, a lot of people estimate. Um, some of them come from families of potters who settled in the area as early as the 1700s, um, mostly coming from England um, and have pretty much made pottery there consistently ever since. Two open studios a year, yes, lots and lots of potters over 30 years ago. Yeah, been around for a while. That's great. Um, I remember when actually growing up as a kid, we used to go um, sometimes right before Christmas, people would have kiln openings and we would go buy Christmas presents there. It was a lot of fun to go and see the potters. Um, so there are great clay deposits there. So a lot of potters still today are actually harvesting their own clay from the earth um, from some of these same uh, deposits and of clay that were um, that were found in you know the mid 1700s or maybe even much much before that um and let's see other potters there um actually come from all over the world so yes we have multi-generational potters there um, however we also have people moving there from all over because there is such a wonderful community of makers there um, people are now moving there to be part of that community um, there is a wonderful place um called Starworks and uh, really close to Seagrove and it's a great, um, I'm looking here, yes, 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 okay. Um, yeah, so potters from all over the world there now. Um, Pam, Pam Owens is one of those people. She actually, I believe she grew up in New Hampshire um, and she learned to make pots pretty early in her life. Um, she comes from a line of New England potters um, and, and was inspired by that family history. Um, she made it to North Carolina as a result of an apprenticeship at Jugtown Pottery. And I think it, that started as a summer position when she was in college. Um, and then when she returned and ended up marrying Vernon Owens, who was a longtime potter for Jugtown Pottery. Um, and actually at the, uh, at the time it was operated by Country Roads, which was an extension of the Smithsonian Folklife Program uh, run by Nancy Sweezy. Um, Jugtown Pottery has been around um, since about the 1920s. Um, so this is a piece of wood fired with salt glaze. Let's see, I saw a question here. What is salt fired? Yes, I'm going to get to that. And Starworks has the best retail store for clay and glass. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you can buy, um, they have a gallery there. They have a shop where you can buy things that are made in the area um, and on site at Starworks. Um, but you can also buy ceramics and glass supplies there as well. So this piece is wood fired with salt glaze. So salt glaze is something um, a lot of putters will call it an atmospheric firing. So basically when your kiln gets up to a certain temperature, when you're firing the work, you can introduce uh, a chemical into that atmosphere. So here they're introducing salt into the kiln. And basically the kiln at this point is so hot that the salt becomes gas-like. So it, it actually enters the atmosphere of the kiln um, and then falls into the pots that way. And it gives a really distinctive look to the pot. Um, and a lot of historic potters actually use the salt uh, instead of having to apply a separate glaze um, because the salt becomes part of the ceramic because the kiln is so hot at this point. And it really provides a sheen, it provides a protective coating, um, and it makes the pot quite a bit sturdier. Um, and now a lot of people are using this as an aesthetic by choice because it's also really quite lovely. 
Um, and we'll see some other examples of it. And I think you'll start to sort of be able to recognize um, some of these nice, warm, kind of toasty tones that you're going to get from a salt firing, um, and as well as uh, some of those things are working. Oh, and I just wanted to add to, I love this piece, and I didn't realize this before, but um, so you, you'll, it looks like there's a little cap on this piece, and actually that top comes out and it's a little cup, so it can kind of serve as a, as a cap or a lid, but it actually is removable and it comes out, and so you can carry your, your beverage of choice there and remove the cup and it'll come out and you can have your drinking vessel ready. Next up is Tara Wilson, and she's the one that started this Women Who Would Fire Instagram account. Um, she's out in Montana, um, she, but she studied at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville um, and then also at the University of Florida. Um, she also has taught a lot of adjunct at community colleges and universities. Um, most of her work is thrown on a potter's wheel and then taken off the wheel and sort of altered into shapes which are slightly um, asymmetrical and, and I found very, very feminine. Um, and what I'm referring to is the, the asymmetry on a potter's wheel, there's centrifugal force, right? So everything is kind of comes out round. Um, and uh, what she's doing is throwing a cylinder. So it looks, you know, like it, its lines can be sort of somewhat straight. And then she takes it off the wheel and alters it so that it can have asymmetry. And by doing that, she'll kind of, you know, you can kind of put your hand back into the piece or a tool and you can push on one side and pull on another and, and, and different methods like that. Um, you're seeing something here called flashing slip. I referred to it before. Um, and this is a great example. You can see some of these different colorations that are happening here. And again, a slip is just, um, it's, a, it's a treatment to the clay, um, but it's usually just made up of a different clay body. Usually it's something different than what the, the actual piece was made out of, the contrasting clay body. The handle is very elegant. I, I think her work is very feminine, almost kind of bird-like sometimes. I think it's really kind of playful, but also really beautiful. Um, so another thing that you're seeing here is you're seeing, um, this is wood fired and you're seeing a lot of ash on this piece and it hasn't been quite as apparent in some of the other works so far. So you're seeing um, where actually ash is landing on this piece during the firing from the wood as it's burning and it's landing and you can kind of tell because um, the tops of these sort of forms in this piece are slightly different colors than sort of the underbodies and you can see that kind of on the handle where the top side is sort of a different color than the really warm orange of the underside. Another local gal is Joy Tanner. Um, she lives out in Bakersville um, and works from her studio called Woodsunk. Um, her husband is Will Baker. They're sort of a sort of a power duo in the area. They both do wood-fired pottery. That's really nice. Um, she also went to college uh, in East Tennessee um, and then moved to Western North Carolina after a residency at Odyssey Clay here in Asheville uh, in the early 2000s. Um, her current work actually, yes, I'll show you, um, often features a little bit more of this sort of carved decoration. Although if we go back, you'll see some of that starting and sort of, some sort of simple line work on the side of this piece. Um, and here in these newer pieces, she's adding a little bit of, uh, so she's still doing the wood firing, um, maybe some slips in there, but she's also um, adding maybe some glaze into these carved areas where you can see there's sort of an olivey kind of color. Next, Donna Craven. Okay, so we're going back to the Seagrove area. Um, Asheboro is just sort of next door to Seagrove. Um, still kind of considered part of that, that area of Seagrove. Um, so this is another salt glazed piece. Um, the Pam Owens piece that we saw was really, um, it's salt glazed, but it was very consistent all the way around. This you're seeing a lot more of the sort of flame and the heat coming from a certain direction in the kiln. So you can actually see where some places um, almost have this kind of drippy look where um, the salt has melted more than in other places. Um, this piece was made around 2001, um, and let's see, have a new piece of hers as well. I just think this is awesome. She's really known for making some rather large works, um, and, and also for her uh, decoration techniques as well. She does a lot of this line work, um, and we talked a little bit about resist techniques with Sequoia Miller, and she's doing something really similar here.
Okay, contemporary and local, and please don't feel like you have to read this screen. <laughs> Um, but I thought it was great. Um, this is actually from the Spruce Pine Potter's Market, which happens really close to um, Penland. Um, so I can count on this screen, Nick Jorling, Michael Klein, Suze Lindsay, Kent McLaughlin, Shane Mickey, and Ronan Kyle Peterson. All of those people, that's half the, half the pictures on the screen right now um, from the Spruce Pine Potter's Market are in this collection of good pictures. Um, and I just think that goes to show um, how much good loved the area and thought it was really important, but also um, what an amazing collection that is that we can tell all of these stories through these pots. Um, so I'll go through, and these are just some uh, some potters who are actively making in the area. Um, I've shown you a few who already who were as well, um, but I just wanted the opportunity to share a few of these artists with you. This is Leah Leitzen. Um, she is uh, she teaches at Warren Wilson College currently and has a studio in West Asheville. Uh, she works primarily in porcelain, so uh, uh, get these really beautiful, nice, bright glaze colors and things like that. Kyle Carpenter is based here in Asheville. Um, he went to UNCA. Um, so great uh, University of uh, Asheville um, and does a lot of teaching, uh, has taught at Penland, actually I think was supposed to teach a workshop this summer at Penland with uh, Michael Klein, who we saw before, and, and hopefully that'll get to happen in 2021. I know they're, they're rescheduling some of those workshops for later on. Um, this is a piece from 2005, um, but let's see, did I? Yes, I included, this is a salt glazed piece um, that also I took from his web shop. So this is um, very current and you can see these are years apart, but you can really see where he's starting to develop um, an aesthetic here even though these, you know, are 15 years apart. Um, and he's known, he does salt glaze, um, but he does also a lot of slip work. So if we look at this piece here, you can see where he's painted on some of these floral, leafy kind of shapes um, with a slip, and then he's salt glazed on top of that. Cynthia Bringle is so beloved in this area. She is absolutely wonderful, um, has taught generations and been a mentor to so many. Um, and we're really fortunate to have several of her pieces in this collection, which is just wonderful. Um, this is wood-fired stoneware. Um, she doesn't always wood fire, uh, but she does quite often, I believe. Um, and this is a great example of her, some of the line work that she does, where she's actually carving into these pieces to make her designs on top. Josh Kopis, some of you might recognize his name. Um, he was part of the Appalachian Now exhibition that we had um, in the fall and had this really monumental um, brick sculpture that was part of his community uh, project that he's been working on up in Marshall where his studio is now. Um, he's also another person that was uh, influenced by uh, Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin who I shared the other piece with you before. That's another kind of fun full circle uh, inspiration that we can talk about now with this collection. Um, Sean Ireland is another, another local maker, um, really close to Penland um, and stayed after uh, uh, he was a resident artist um, there. He also is a painter um, and spends a lot of time in Cortona, Italy, which I think is wonderful. There's a University of Georgia program for ceramics there. Um, and a lot of our area potters have been part of that program. Um, you can kind of see that influence on time. That's really great. This is a slip worked piece um, and he uses a lot of uh, materials, clay, glaze materials that he actually harvests himself um, and processes at his studio, which is incredibly labor intensive um, and pretty incredible um, to still be doing some of those processes today and, and often cites that he really enjoys the pace that sort of forces him to slow down. Um, and then the last two I'll share with you are Matt Jones and Mark Hewitt. And I'll go back and forth between these a couple of times. I love this relationship because um, Matt Jones was actually, he's here up in Leicester, Sandy Mush area. Um, if you all are local, um, it's about maybe 45 minutes outside of town. Um, and Matt Jones was an apprentice to Mark Hewitt. And you can see um, clearly some of the inspiration for the forms that he's making um, have, have been informed by his time as an apprentice with Mark Hewitt um, and also his glaze technique. So um, these, this is the piece by Matt Jones is a salt glaze piece. Um, you can see the one example of this inspiration is this great um, 
this big, these big drip, drips down the pitcher. And this is where they're actually using, taking cut glass and inserting it into the clay before they fire it. And the glass melts down and creates that glaze technique. And you can see this on Mark Hewitt's piece as well. Let's see, I'm gonna go back and see if I've missed any questions. That's all of the pieces I have to share with you today. Um, does anybody have any, any last minute questions that you'd like me to talk about? Or a piece you wanna see again or anything? See, we have some other collectors in the audience, some people who have some of the pots, pieces by uh, makers that we've just talked about. That's wonderful. Are those two human figures in the second to last pottery? Uh, Kathy, is that Sean Ireland? Is that who you're talking about? This is the second to last, Matt Jones. I don't see human figures, but if you do, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love that. Porcelain and stoneware. Yes, stoneware um, is basically porcelain and stoneware, two different types of clay bodies. So it really just refers to the material makeup of the clay um, and sometimes how high it's, how high of a temperature it's fired to. Will this collection be exhibited at some point at the museum? We actually, we already are using these pieces frequently in exhibitions. Um, there was a show called Let It Pour several years ago um, that I think was all, all pieces from this collection, although um, showing, you know, 300, over 300 pictures at one time, I think would be really difficult. Um, of course, you know, I would love that. Um, but yeah, we try to incorporate them into other exhibitions um, that that we do so that we can tell different stories along alongside other pieces in our collections. Babby, I see your comment. Um, I we can talk to let's see. Oh, great. Yes. Okay, so we can. Kristen, do you want to chime in? Yes, so I already responded, but we will have a recording of today's program in our museum e-newsletter that is sent out tomorrow. And just for your all, all your reference, um, we do uh, include the recording of the member programs in the e-newsletter that we send out every Thursday. So that will happen going forward as well for as long as we remain closed and have these virtual programs. Great, thank you. And I love that you all are seeing figures here. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> Great, well, thanks so, so much everyone for tuning in. I know you all have things to get back to, so we really appreciate you tuning in for a while. Yes, thank you all. And thank you so much, Sarah, for leading this great program today. It was super interesting. And as a beginning potter myself, I found it very fascinating. Um, if anyone else has questions that weren't answered, please feel free to email them to me. I'll compile them for Sarah. And as a reminder, I will also send out a program evaluation in a little bit to collect your feedback about today's conversation with the curator. And I'll work with Sarah to get those Instagram handles included in that email for you so you can all follow along uh, with some of your favorite potters and uh, I just want to say thank you again for joining us I hope you all stay well and I hope to see you again in the coming weeks so thank you I'm going to end the meeting now and thank you again Sarah thanks everyone